back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. On Science Fantastic, we profile some of the most amazing developments in science, things that will touch our lives and change the way we view reality itself. And with us today to challenge our belief in reality is uh, Dr. Donald Hoffman. He's a professor of cognitive science at the University of California at Irvine, and he's the author of a new book called The Case Against Reality, Why Evolution Hid the Truth from Our Eyes. Now, you may say to yourself, this is crazy stuff. I mean, what? The Case Against Reality Itself? I mean, we have an expression, what you see is what you get. And seeing is believing. But is that really true? I mean, has evolution given us a brain that takes shortcuts, convenient shortcuts in order to rapidly assess dangerous situations? Or is what we see really reality? So once again, today we're going to ask the question, does the brain take shortcuts and give you an abridged, simplified version of reality? So what you see is not really what you get, and seeing is not really believing. So once again, with us today is Professor Donald Hoffman. The book, with a controversial title, is called The Case Against Reality, Why Evolution Hid the Truth from Our Eyes. Uh, now, Donald, uh, tell us a little bit about how you, as a young kid, first got interested in science, psychology, and eventually cognitive science. Well, as a, a teenager, I started playing around with programming in the 1970s and started to see the power of programming in the early early days of programming. And I was also interested in philosophical questions about uh, you know perception and and reality, and also the the you know the question that came up to me after programming a bit was, are we machines? Are people just machines, or is there something more to us? And I wanted to actually try to understand that question. And not just philosophically, but more rigorously. And so I went to UCLA and uh, took uh, a bunch of classes that were involving computer science, mathematics, and psychology. And then went to MIT and worked in the artificial intelligence lab and what's now the brain and cognitive science department, trying to get as rigorous an understanding as I could of what uh, what machines can do in artificial intelligence and, and what people are in the brain and cognitive sciences department, and then trying to put them all together to understand our place in nature and the nature of human um, existence. Okay, now when we look at a computer screen, we see icons. Now these icons are not really reality, but by clicking it, we can then access enormous amounts of information painlessly by using these little icons. Now are you saying therefore that the brain uses these little icons to represent very complex reality features and we take shortcuts constantly? That's right. There's good evidence that um, throughout nature that animals use tricks and heuristics and shortcuts um, to you know just get through the day. The idea is to to get enough fitness payoffs to to stay alive long enough to reproduce. And you can think about the evolutionary framework as like a video game. In, in a video game, what you're doing is trying as quickly as you can to get as many points as you can at your current level. If you get enough points quickly enough, then you get to the next level. Otherwise, you die and you have to put in more money. And in evolution, if you, you're collecting fitness payoffs, if you get enough fitness payoffs, um, then you don't go to the next generation, the next level, but your, your offspring, uh, your genes get passed to the next generation in, in, in your children. And so anything that's distracting you from payoffs will be a distraction from the, the real game here. And so evolution has, has shaped us and our perceptions to help us to find payoffs, and that turns out to be very different from finding the truth. And talk about finding the truth. I was once part of an experiment myself. I was shown a videotape of a basketball game, a very simple rapid-fire basketball game, and the goal was to count count the number of times the ball exchanged hands. So as the as the test went on, I had to concentrate, to calculate exactly how many times the ball changed hands. Afterwards, I was shown the videotape once again, and there was a huge, ugly black gorilla walking in the middle of the basketball game. 
And I didn't see that gorilla at all. So how is it possible that I could watch a basketball game, count the basketball uh, as it goes back and forth, and miss this gigantic black gorilla sitting right in front of me? Yes, that's called uh, well. It, it, it's called um, attention blindness, and it turns out that we think that we have um, full resolution vision throughout our whole visual world that we see all of um, the world in high reality. In fact, you only see a small disk about two degrees in, in diameter, which is roughly twice the width of your thumb at arm's length. A little disk about, you know, the radius of your thumb, that's all that you have really high resolution vision in. And so we move our eyes around to put that high resolution vision on different parts of the world where we might get, you know, information that's relevant to our fitness. And so things that we don't pay attention to, um, we either, you know, miss altogether or only get very, very vague information about. So so we're, we're under the illusion, actually, that we see reality in great detail. In fact, we have only great detail uh, in a small disk of radius about one degree. So it's uh, a lot of things that, that are surprising about our perceptual systems. And speaking about consciousness, uh, epileptics sometimes have to have the connection between the left and the right brain cut in order to stop them from having these debilitating seizures. But as I understand your book, once you cut the connection between the left brain and the right brain, two distinct personalities can begin to emerge. Uh, one personality could be an atheist. The other personality could be a believer. And you can imagine what happens if one half of your brain is Republican and the other half of your brain is Democrat, and you're asked to go to the polling booth to hit the switch. You have an argument between your left hand and your right Right hand in the voting booth. So is that really true that in split brain situations, two distinct personalities can gradually emerge? Yes, this is research that's been done by Mike Gazaniga and, and others, and also um, a friend of mine, B.S. Ramachandran, who's, who studies some of these patients. And they do find uh, that the two different hemispheres first can have very, very different contents of consciousness. The left hemisphere might be aware of the word a uh, ring and the right hemisphere might be aware of the word key and and neither hemisphere is aware of the word that the other hemisphere is aware of and so you can and they can even play 20 questions with each other and the, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere can play 20 questions the right hemisphere has a word and the left hemisphere has to guess it and it doesn't know so it can ask questions and and you're right that even in some patients they've gotten clear evidence that um, in one guy the left hemisphere wanted to be um a draftsman, and the right hemisphere wanted to be a race car driver. So very, very different um, desires there. And as you mentioned, there are theological differences too. I believe in one person, the left hemisphere. This is a uh, study by V.S. Ramachandran. Uh, the left hemisphere, I believe, wanted to is a believer in God, and the right hemisphere is an atheist. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. And the guest today is Professor Donald Hoffman, author of a new book with the outrageous title, The Case Against Reality. That is, what you see is not necessarily what is. Why Evolution Hid the Truth from Our Eyes. Now, you have one chapter in your book where you talk about the results of evolutionary psychology and the whole question of beauty and attractiveness comes into play. Madison Avenue, of course, makes millions of dollars on the question of beauty and the perception of beauty. But it goes back to the question, well, what do women want and what do men want in a relationship? Now, Sigmund Freud asked that question and he couldn't come up with an answer. What do women want? Now, what you're saying is that in evolutionary psychology, there is a hidden agenda that our brain, as a byproduct of evolution, want certain things that we're not really aware of. So what about the question, what do women want, what do men want, and what does beauty have anything to do with it? Yes, yeah, so from an evolutionary point of view, um, attractiveness, when we look at a person and find them attractive, uh, what, what's going on is a very sophisticated computation. We're evaluating dozens, perhaps hundreds of, of different cl clues, like the the smoothness of the skin, the shininess of the hair, features of the eyes, of their voice, the symmetry of the face. And what we're doing is we're evaluating 
unconsciously and in less than a second, we're evaluating the reproductive potential of that person. That is, what is the probability that that person is healthy and could uh, bear or have raise and raise kids? And again, it's not conscious. We're not consciously you know, asking that question, but it's the unconscious computation that's going on. And the, the end result of that is just our feeling of attractiveness. Um, if, if they're very, very attractive, that's because we've estimated that they have, you know, high reproductive potential. Now, of course, this is just the initial hit that we get when we talk with a person or first meet them. Um, there's much more to relationships than that initial hit, but it's quite interesting to understand what's going on in that initial hit. Well, we had one evolutionary psychologist on Science Fantastic who said that, well, what do women want on average? Because, of course, everyone's different. But on average, what women want is men with resources. That is, they're yep. successful. They have enough money to, to sponsor their children and therefore propagate their genes. And what do men want? Women, men want women who are healthy, have hourglass figures, are youthful, because they can also have children and propagate the species. So are you saying, therefore, that there's a hidden agenda, that what our genes really want is to simply propagate themselves into the next generation, and therefore there are two different strategies to do it. Women look for success, and men look for health. What are your thoughts? That's right. That's, that's exactly what the, the research shows us, is that, that men are looking for youth and health in, in the woman, because that's the critical thing that during the Pleistocene, when, our, when we seem to have evolved many of our cognitive and perceptual um, strategies, um, that was a time from about, you know, roughly 1.9 million years ago until about you know, 10,000, 12,000 years ago. So during that time, the resources that a woman brings to the table weren't, weren't so critical, but the resources a man brings to the table were critical during that time. And so women were shaped by evolution to, to um, find men attractive who had higher social standing and more resources, which are, are correlated. And, and men and women are both... Um, shaped by evolution to prefer youth, but the shaping is far stronger in men because women's reproductive um, span is curtailed more quickly than a man's. And so, so the selection pressures on men to prefer youth are actually stronger than the selection pressures for women, although both have selection pressures. So, and it also you know, even depends, um, you know, on the time of the month for, for the woman, what, what she finds attractive. So it's, it's complicated, but it seems to be that it's all, again, it's not a conscious strategy necessarily. It's what the genes have shaped us to just find attractive or not. Now, some people say hogwash because you can't test it. These are events that took place thousands and thousands of years ago with our ancestors in the forest. But some people say no. In a university setting with college students, you can actually perform experiments on them to test some aspects of evolutionary psychology, starting with things like the eye. So explain to us the iris and the eye and the question of attractiveness. Yes. So I noticed in looking at photographs of, of people from infancy to old age that there's um, a ring around the iris. If you look at the, the iris is the colored part of the eye. And right where the, the colored part of the eye meets the white of the eye, in many people you'll see a ring there. It's called the limbal ring. And I noticed in photographs that it looked statistically to be thicker and more distinct in infants on average than in older adults. And so I figured that that's an evolutionary cue to um, youth and health. So I predicted on evolutionary grounds that, that people would be more attractive if they had more distinct um, and visible limbal rings. And so we did experiments where we would show a bunch of faces uh, where it was the same face side by side. On one side, there was no limbal ring or very little limbal ring. And on the other side, we had a nice distinct limbal ring. And we would ask people to just say which face was more attractive. And, and they would look at us and go, well, they're, they're exactly the same face. There's, there's nothing different. And we'd say, just humor us. Um, pick, you know, just, just pick one that looks more attractive. And, and what we found was that they statistically were far more preferred the ones that had the limbal ring, even though they had no idea what was going on there. So, so we found this both in men and women and in over a wide variety of faces. And then I also noticed that in, again, pictures of, of in, uh, people from infancy to adulthood, that the iris itself, the, the colored part of the eye, is 
a larger proportion of the eye in an infant than it is in an adult. It could be almost 90% of the visible eye in an infant and about 41% in an adult. So once again, it looks like the iris size is a signal of your age. And so I predicted that in, in women, because men prefer younger women, they like youth and women, that if we took a woman's face and expanded her iris just a little bit, that she would be more attractive. And we tried that and it worked. So this is a case where we're using evolutionary principles not to make you know just those stories about what happened a million years ago, I'm making new predictions that we can go test in the lab today. Well, we had one psychologist on the air who said that on a blind date, you cannot a man cannot do a blood test on a woman to find out how much estrogen is in their blood in order to see if they can have healthy children. So you need markers that can rapidly tell you how much estrogen is in their blood. And you do that by looking at three things. One is chin. The chin has to be triangular and small. Second, the lips. The lips have to be full. And the nose has to be, again, proportionally shaped. And, of course, the eyes, as you mentioned. And these are estrogen markers, markers that uh, allow you to rapidly calculate in shorthand how much estrogen is circulating in the blood of the women that you're dating. Now, is that all nonsense, or is there some truth to it? Oh, there's some truth to it. We, we, genetically, we need to find out, as you say, um, the, the health of the genes and also the, the, the hormone levels of the person to see if they're really going to be able to, you know, bear kids and, and, and raise kids. But we, you know, as we can't do blood tests, so we have to look at cues in the body itself. And so estrogen caps bone growth, so it makes for smaller bones, you know, like as you said, the smaller chin. And it also puts fatty deposits uh, on the lips and the, the uh, upper cheek and so forth. Uh, so by looking at the shape of the face and, and the overall shape of the body, one can estimate the, the estrogen levels and also, you know, in the, the hourglass shape, whether they, the, the, the female has enough of the long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids that will be needed to actually build the healthy brain in, in an infant. So, again, these aren't the things that are on a man's mind uh, consciously, but this is all wired into us unconsciously and what we find attractive. Now, some critics may say that all this is nonsense. It's a byproduct of a Western culture that believes in male domination. And, uh, well, it's just basically Western culture magnified in, with pseudoscience. But what happens when you take these results overseas to analyze other cultures, other situations where we don't have the, quote, contamination from Western standards? What happens then? Yes, so it has been found um, by a number of researchers testing the cross-cultural aspect of this is that uh, they've tested in African countries, of course, Western uh, countries, and then also in Asian countries, and they find that this is a universal property, that men uh, prefer women whose waist-to-hip ratio is about two to three. That is the... the okay, let's take another short commercial break, and after the break, we're going to continue a discussion of this new book, The Case Against Reality. Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Once again, our special guest today is Professor Donald Hoffman, Professor of Cognitive Science at the University of California at Irvine in California. And the book is called, quote, The Case Against Reality. A rather outrageous title, but, well, yeah, what you see is not necessarily what you get. And the subtitle is Why Evolution Hid the Truth from Our Eyes. Now, as we said before, there are critics of this theory. Critics of the theory say that all this happened millions, thousands of years ago. No tests were performed, and the tests that are performed are done in Western cultures. So explain to us again what happens when we go to other cultures analyzing the question of perception, beauty, and what women want and what men want. Right. What we've found is that, for example, in, in estimations of the most attractive waist-to-hip ratio, um, that is universal. It's not just in the United States and you know, Western European countries. It's also in Africa and Asia. 
So that seems to be a universal feature of, of you know, male ratings of female attractiveness. With the body mass index, it's, it's pretty interesting. Body mass index is you know, an estimate of how much you weigh compared to how tall you are. And if you have a higher body mass index, that means that you're a heavier person. And there it turns out that there is variation um, across the world in what men find most attractive in the body mass index. But some research indicates that that may be due to the amount of food that's available and the, and the possibility of famine. If you live in a place where famine is, is a serious possibility, then men prefer women with a higher body mass index. They're going to be more robust in that very difficult um, situation. But in, in, in you know, areas where there's not famine, then men will prefer a slightly lower body mass index. Now, right now, there's a controversy on social media, on the Internet, if you follow it, uh, because a series of very well-established men in Hollywood are now marrying young uh, women who are one-third their age. An example of a May-December marriage where the man has resources, is successful, is filthy rich, and the woman is young, has a nice figure, and uh, can bear children. So are you saying, therefore, that this is good, bad, or this is just what is, rather than a statement of ethics and morality? Right. The, the question of morality is a very interesting one from an evolutionary point of view, but from from evolutionary psychology, the, the, these men and women are actually following the programs that are that are wired into us. Um, of course, the program, programs are very very complicated. It's not just one little algorithm we have. There's lots of interacting algorithms. So, but in in the case where you know an, an old, older man with lots of resources is, is uh, marrying a younger woman, um, that that does fit in with with this evolutionary algorithm. Um, the issue of morality more generally is very, very difficult from an evolutionary point of view. So, for example, in the case of humans, um, murdering your brothers and sisters is, is very, very bad. I mean, that's just nothing we want to do. But in the case of a bird called the blue-footed booby, um, suicide is always happening. So every time the, the mother lays eggs, she has two, and the first thing the two chicks do when they hatch is fight to the death, and she doesn't stop them. Um, the one picks, packs the other to the death or, or puts out in the sun. And she doesn't stop them. She killed her sibling. And apparently in that situation, their niche does not have enough resources to successfully raise two chicks. And so evolution has this quandary. It's either extinction or suicide. And the choice is suicide. And they have two chicks to find out which one will be the most fit. And it fights to get into the next generation. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. With us today is Professor Donald Hoffman, Professor of Cognitive Science at the University of California at Irvine, author of a book with a rather outrageous title, The Case Against Reality. What you see, the colors, the shapes, the smells, are they a representation of reality? Or is your brain fooling you? Is your brain simply taking hundreds of shortcuts in order to make you survive so that you can rapidly respond to very complex emergencies and complex situations? So once again, the book is called The Case Against Reality. Well, uh, when we left off, we were talking about what is versus what should be. Some people say, well, yeah, 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 maybe evolution did give us all these instincts that men want women who are young and have an hourglass figure, that women in turn want men who are successful and have resources, but can't we rise above that? Do we have to obey the laws of the jungle? What are your thoughts? Well, I think that we have these innate responses that are wired into us, but we also have the ability to look and make decisions in light of other considerations that we find important. So, so for example, um, one, one important aspect of, of relationships is what's called the parental investment uh, in, in sexual reproduction. Um, when you have sexual reproduction, one of the parents may require more of their effort and time to raise the kid that raise the offspring than another. That's called the, the amount of parental investment. And it turns out that the, the sex with the greatest parental investment will be the most choosy sex and the, the, uh, in, in terms of choosing partners. And the sex with the least parental investment will be um, the, the, the least choosy sex. And so in, 
Homo sapiens in our species, the females have the greatest parental investment. They, they, they require, you know, to be pregnant for nine months and breastfeed and so forth. Whereas men, you know, it could, at a minimum, it could just be a few minutes is the only investment that they make to successfully have offspring. So, so, but it turns out that it's not just male versus female. In, in, in certain species, the, the, the male actually um, raises the offspring. So, um, so in that, in that case, where the male is actually raising the offspring, then the female has to um, is the less picky, and the male is the more picky one. Um, so 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 we have lots of these different parameters that that are going around, and we have various strategies that we can choose. And you know, the strategy of being with one partner for a lifetime and raising just a few offspring is is a very very healthy strategy. But also the just from an evolutionary point of view, a strategy in which you have many partners and less investment can also work. Um, but in, in, you know, human society, so both strategies happen, and we, we tend to put moral values on it. Um, but in other species, you're right, it, it, both strategies are going on, and we don't put a moral value on it. So this, again, raises the deep question of, of what is the ultimate basis of right and wrong. Now, some people think that uh, men are shallow. That is, they look at superficial features. So they're not very deep. While women are much deeper and coy, they have to be very careful because, well, men will lie to them. And they have to have a good sense of character judgment because men will lie to them to get what they want. While men tend to be shallow because, as you said, their investment is very, very small in a relationship. So you think, therefore, that this is really true in relationships, that women are more coy because they have to be more choosy because they're stuck for 18 years with a kid. Well, men can be flippant and superficial. What are your thoughts? Right. So this does seem to be, again, a, an, an example of that parental investment idea, that women do have the greater parental investment. And so a woman who is not careful and not choosy um, risks making uh, a mistake that's far more costly to her in terms of her reproductive potential than it is for a man. So as, as a result, women are just programmed automatically to be to be more careful in general. I mean, this is all statistical. And there are individual differences, but but to be more careful in their choice of a man, to find a man um, who has not only a good genetic, you know composition but but also will have other qualities that can they can bring to the table they'll be faithful they'll stick with her they'll provide resources and so forth so so yeah it's for men it seems in a way it's a bit simpler it's youth and health and that those those are dominating to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. Once again, if you want to find out more about Science Fantastic, go to my website. Website is mkaku.org, M-K-A-K-U.org. I've written four New York Times bestsellers, and we have three million fans on Facebook. But today we're talking about, quote, the case against reality. Did you know that some psychologists think that our perception of color, of space, of time, is in some sense incorrect that the brain takes shortcuts even with our perception of color, smells, space, and time. Let's break it down now. Now, when you see a color, you only see really three colors. The primary colors, our retina can only see three colors, red, green, and blue. So in some sense, you've never really seen yellow. You've never really seen brown. They are mixtures of those three primary colors. And so in some sense, the brain is taking a shortcut. There's so many colors, thousands of colors, in fact. Brain can't possibly process them. So it takes a snapshot, three colors, and then gives you the illusion that you're seeing purple as it really is. So what are your thoughts about how the brain tricks us? So, yes, we definitely channel the, the wide range of electromagnetic radiation uh, you know all the different frequencies into you know only three channels. So there's this you know thousands and thousands of possibilities. We stick them through three different holes, and that's all we've got. Three different receptor types: red, green, and blue. Long, medium, and short. We call them. And then also um, the, the the rod system. 
But there are pigeons have four color systems, and some creatures like the mantis shrimp has more than ten. Uh, so, so different creatures will have different you know, capacities, different number of channels for processing color. We're we're not uh, anywhere near the best by by any means uh, on that. And it does seem to be a general feature that that we're not seeing reality as it is. We're we're seeing something very very different. The, the, the way I like to think of it is like the desktop interface on your on your computer. And if you're you know if you're writing an email and the the icon on your desktop for your email is blue and rectangular in the middle of your screen, does that mean that the email itself in your computer is blue and rectangular and in the middle of your computer? Well, of course not. Anybody who thought that is misunderstanding the point of the interface. It's not there to show you the truth. It's there to hide the truth and give you simple eye candy that lets you control the truth, which in this metaphor is the circuits and software and voltages, without having to know what's going on there. And if you had to toggle voltages to craft an email, your friends would never hear from you. And, and that's what evolution has, has done for us. It's, it's given us um, perceptions that are a user interface. So three-dimensional space is just like our three-dimensional desktop, and physical objects are just like three-dimensional icons in that desktop. It's like a 3D virtual reality that we've gotten that, that hides the truth and, and just lets us do what we need to do to stay alive. So seeing the truth will actually make you extinct. Not seeing the truth, having the right interface, um, will help you to stay alive. Now, now let's talk about the question of space and time. Now, I'm a physicist, and most physicists bristle at the idea that if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to listen to the tree, then, well, maybe the tree didn't fall in the forest. And it gets into the whole question of consciousness, perception, space, and time. But I think most physicists would say that, well, the dinosaurs walked the earth before humans. There was a reality before consciousness, that is, human consciousness evolved. But when well, let's talk about space and time. Optical illusions tell us that our conception of space and time is faulty. That's why we go to science museums to watch these optical illusions. But does that mean, therefore, that maybe reality itself is an illusion? What are your thoughts? Yes, we. it's, it's very well received within the field of cognitive science that we construct what we see, that we construct our perceptions of space and time and objects. Most of my colleagues think that our constructions are in fact faithful reconstructions of reality so that when I look up and see the moon, um, what I'm seeing is a, is a faithful representation of something that really exists and resembles in many respects what I'm perceiving. And what I'm arguing is that in fact space-time itself is just a data structure that we create that represents fitness payoffs and it's not there to um, resemble a pre-existing space-time. And, and what we call physical objects are also just data structures that we create on the fly. Think about having a virtual reality world where you have a headset on and say you're playing you know, a, an you know, a auto racing game. So you look at, you see your steering wheel, you look to the right, you don't see the steering wheel. You've, you've deleted the steering wheel because you're no longer rendering it. Now you look over to the right, you see a car and you, you create the car, then you look away and now you've you know, uncreated that car. Every time you look back, you'll see the car, but you, you know, you're only creating the car when you look at it. There's no real car because this is all just virtual reality. And that's what I'm proposing is happening all the time. We, we have a headset on. Evolution gave us a headset. It's space time is, is the 3D format of it and physical objects are, are fitness payoff representations that we render when we look. So I look at an apple. I create the apple and the fitness payoff. So I look away and I, I garbage collect it. I, I throw that away. But when I look back, I'm, I'm interacting with some reality, and I then come up with the symbol of an apple. So that's just my homo sapiens specific representation of fitness payoffs. And it doesn't really tell me the truth. It just tells me what I need to do to, to stay alive. Well, I'm a physicist, and physicists believe in experiments. So let's do an experiment. Let's jump off a cliff. When you jump off a cliff, chances are gravity is going to take over and you're probably going to die as a consequence. And that's not a question of subjective reality. So are you saying, therefore, that human space-time is subjective and prone to errors and so on and so forth? Human space-time, but physical space-time is objective or more objective than human space-time. Uh, you have 10 seconds to answer that question. <laughs> Sorry about that. There is a reality. There 
there is a reality that's a, that's objective, but it's not space and time. <laughs> Okay. Well, unfortunately, we have run out of time. Uh, once again, you've been listening to Professor Donald Hoffman, author of an exciting new book called The Case Against Reality, Why Evolution Hid the Truth from Our Eyes.